Hello, my name is Kevin Goldsmith. I am so pleased to be speaking once again to Agile by Example. Of course, I'm disappointed that I can't be there in person, but I'm just happy uh, that, that we were able to do this in, in this way. In the past, you've heard me talk about team autonomy uh, in the context of this is how we did it, or this is how this worked for us. This year, I wanted to talk about team autonomy but from the context of where I've seen it go wrong, where I've just seen teams or companies do it incorrectly, and then talk about ways that if this is a problem you're having, you can address it. Or if you're thinking of moving to a, an autonomous team model, some of the things that you need to put in place for it to be successful. So obviously, uh, you know, why even talk about team autonomy? Why is that important? Well, team autonomy is actually very well aligned to Agile. Uh, the goals of team autonomy are really to improve de uh, decision-making within a team and reduce dependencies on other teams. The reason we do that is because it actually improves velocity and makes it much easier for teams to deliver value to their customers more quickly, which is very, very well aligned to autonomy and, and just a generally good goal. So that is why we, why we talk about autonomous teams and why we look at things like autonomous team models, especially in the world of Agile. Now, you might have seen this slide before because when I talk about uh, autonomy for teams, I, I tend to show this slide. These are what I would consider the requirements of autonomy. Uh, giving teams context. Now, context means information, giving them visibility. Uh, because as I said, the goal of autonomy is to let them make decisions you can't make good decisions without good information. Trust. If you can't trust the decisions the teams are making, you're, they're not going to be autonomous because there's going to be a lot of questioning and challenging, which means that you're going to slow down the team, which is kind of not the point. Right? The entire point is to speed the team up. Reducing dependencies on other teams. Again, this means that there's less coordination bottlenecks, less um, uh, uh, decision-making bottlenecks. It just means a team can go faster. And then if these are in place and teams can make decisions on their own, they can execute on those decisions and they are autonomous. So where does it go wrong? Uh, how do teams go wrong when they're trying to create autonomy? Because when it does go wrong, it, it's actually it can be worse than if the team uh, didn't do it in the first place, right? What are those autonomous sins? What are the mistakes that I see and I have seen multiple times? First of all, a lack of leadership. Uh, autonomous teams is not the same thing as saying leaderless teams. Now, it doesn't mean that leadership needs to be embodied in a single person. It could be in a person, it could be in a small group of people within the team, it could be the entire team itself, but that, that, that leadership needs to be present. Without that leadership, uh, it's very, very hard for the team to make any kind of prog progress, right? It's going to end up with a lot of disagreement within the team and fighting. So the team has to be, uh, has to have some leader, whether it's formal or informal, an individual, a group, or the entire team, and it has to be understood. Guidance. Now, I mean guidance from the outside. So building an autonomous team model, you still need to set the environment for good decisions. And that includes on, uh, making it clear what are, is the parameters of decisions a team can make. Because without that, again, the team doesn't have a, a notion of what kind of decisions they can make, what's a good decision, what's a bad decision, what's within bounds, and what's out of bounds. So as part of team creation, as part of mission uh, de definition, or as part of the organizational model definition, it ha these things have to be understood. That guidance has to be present for the team, or they'll find themselves going off in a direction that's maybe a poor one, and then have to backtrack, and it's a lot of wasted time and effort. Not having a clear mission for the team. So the mission sets the, sets the, the parameters of the problem that the team is trying to solve. Now, without a clear mission, again, there's no necessarily a good agreement on what the team is trying to achieve. Also, without a clear mission, you may have find that you have teams kind of 
overlapping and challenging each other, like what ownership over what part of what problem isn't clear, which creates friction in the organization, or again, a lot of waste. Uh, if the team doesn't understand this or the larger organization around the team doesn't understand the mission of the team, you're going to create a lot of friction and that's going to be a significant problem. No vision. So with mission comes vision. So knowing the mission is critical, but also making sure that the team has a vision. Where are, what, when you solve the problem of the mission, what is the world going to look like? How is the world different for the team achieving its goals? That sets up the, the sort of North Star for the team and helps with alignment, especially because that vision needs to be aligned to the bigger vision of the organization and the company as well. So missions can't overlap because that creates friction. Vision should overlap because that's the definition of alignment. A lack of oversight. So I've seen this a lot in companies, especially where you have less experienced management. They want an autonomous team model, but then they get very concerned. They get very afraid of stepping on the team's autonomy, which translates into a lack of oversight. So the team is making decisions, and if the team goes off in a direction that's, that's a poor choice or not well aligned to the larger organization, there's no one there to stop the team or put them back on track or take responsibility for helping the team because of this fear of, of impeding the autonomy of a team. But that isn't a, a good choice, right? Because all you're doing is setting up the team for failure and allowing it to fail and then hoping that they'll correct themselves. But at a certain point, some it's going to be noticeable in the larger organization. And what you may find is the team starts to lose autonomy because it's losing trust with the larger organization. And if you are that leader that's responsible for making sure the team is doing the right thing, you're also going to lose trust. That could actually endanger the entire, uh, the entire project of having autonomous teams. Accountability and autonomy are, go hand in hand. Uh, there is no true team autonomy without team accountability. And the team has to feel accountable for its results. Otherwise, it, it won't be autonomous. What structures and systems are put in place for the team to own its accountability Who's responsible if the team doesn't achieve its mission? What are the consequences of not achieving its mission and who feels them? Autonomy without accountability doesn't work. And it's again, if the larger organization or the leadership doesn't feel that the team is accountable for their decisions, then the team will lose trust and, and uh, they'll lose autonomy not having a good way to measure success. And I mean a true objective way to measure success. Without this, uh, the team may feel that it's making progress towards its mission, that it's doing a good job. But outside the team, that view isn't shared. Without true objective uh, measurements that are agreed on not only by the team, but by the larger organization, you end up again with a difference of stories, a very subjective opinion of whether the team is doing well. And that again can create a loss of trust within the organization. The organization loses trust because the team thinks it's doing well, but outside the team, the team looks like it's failing. And both could be true if you don't have a generally agreed upon set of uh, objective measures of, of the team working towards its mission not providing, I talked about having context for the team being critical for making good decisions. Now, what I've often seen this sin appear as is not that kind of the worst case scenario, there's someone in the organization who's hoarding information for, for whatever reason, for nefarious purposes. What it tends to be, what I mostly see, is that information isn't shared because it isn't realized that the, it's felt that the team doesn't need it. Uh, and you don't want to overwhelm the team or the organization with too much information. The problem is from outside this autonomous team, it's very, very hard to know what information is relevant and what isn't. So by trying to filter in order to protect the team from too much information, what mostly happens is you starve the team of critical information it needs to make good decisions. The team then makes bad decisions, loses trust, 
loses autonomy. The team is not a team. So sometimes this manifests as, uh, you know, you, you have uh, more work streams than you have people or the right skill set. And so now you have people that kind of float between teams or entire teams that are made up of part-time people. And, and companies I've been in have had this problem. They addressed a work stream problem by creating more teams, but they didn't have enough people. So then people would be on multiple teams, which meant that if I'm not a full-time member of the team, I am no longer accountable uh, to the team's goals because I am having to personally make decisions on my own time where I should spend my time, which then again leads to a lack of accountability. Uh, the team no longer feels accountable to its actions, loses trust, loses autonomy. The team is missing the needed skills they need to achieve their mission. So uh, this can happen in a lot of ways where the team takes on a, a new technology or there's a technology that's critical, but the team doesn't actually have the skills. So does the team have the ability to acquire those skills either permanently, let's say by hiring or training, or temporarily if they only need them temporarily by getting them from some other place uh, outside the organization or from another team? And then how much negotiation has to happen for that to, to take place? So if the team is getting a skill it needs from outside the team, does it have to negotiate with them? Does it have to coordinate? Again, now you're introducing these sort of bottlenecks that rob the autonomy of the team. The team is missing resources. Now this is you know time and money and equipment and, and, and people the, as well. It doesn't have as many people to achieve its mission. Now uh, it can't be autonomous in this situation because it is honestly set up to fail. If a team has a mission, that requires a set of resources, the team doesn't have the resources, the team is not going to succeed, it just is not. Now, this doesn't mean the team should be given carte blanche to, to have whatever it wants, uh, because that's also where uh, oversight and guidance and accountability come into play. But if there's a true need for the team that uh, to achieve its mission that isn't provided, the team can't be autonomous. Now, teams getting overruled, or especially overruled frequently. Now, because I made the point that you need oversight, that does mean that there is an opportunity for, at some point, a team makes a decision, starts acting on it, that decision becomes visible outside the team. Somebody, uh, someone in a position of responsibility over that team decides this is a bad decision and, and overrules it. That can happen, that is part of oversight. But it is, if it is happening constantly, the team will move from making decisions to making requests for decisions to be made. Because if they get into a pattern where they don't believe their decisions will be approved or will be reversed later, they will start to ask for permission. And at that point, the team is no longer autonomous. Now, there could be reasons why this is happening. One could be that you actually, if, it, if you have a, several autonomous teams and this is only happening to one team, that could be a problem with the team. That uh, whoever's on the team, whoever's in the position of, or how the team is working is producing bad decisions. And therefore, it's a problem with the team that needs to be rectified. Sometimes it's also a problem with the leader. That the leader is, is overruling the team too frequently. In either of these cases, that, that problem needs to be rectified or you'll actually risk harming the autonomy of the whole organization because when other teams see that this one team's decisions are being overruled and then they move into, that team moves into an asking instead of making decisions, other teams will eventually follow suit because they'll see that that's what, they'll, they'll, they'll figure out that that's what is expected. Team, uh, the team receiving work from outside the organization. Now, this is uh, very, very common. Uh, this happened at multiple companies I've been at. It's a, especially common, uh, I've seen from my own experience, uh, young companies where the team has grown quickly and especially senior leadership is used to just showing up and, and asking for things and having teams build them for them. When that happens, uh, in these kinds of organizations, that is a hard habit to break. 
But if the team is really owning its own backlog and responsible for its own backlog, uh, and work keeps coming in from the side that the team doesn't feel the ability to, to say no to, the team's losing its autonomy again because it will m- become a lot more reactive and a lot less deliberate in planning and in, in, in a planning mode. Now, there are teams, of course, there's teams like uh, product support or things like that, where ne- nearly their definition is that uh, work is going to come from the outside. But uh, that is fairly rare within the organization. And, and when I talk about things like product development, that very much should not be the case. Now, many of the things I talk about, I'm talking about in the context of autonomous teams. And as I said, autonomous teams and agile, I believe, are very related but they're not the same thing. Agility and agile practices don't require autonomous teams. I think they work better with autonomous teams, but it's not a a hard and fast rule. But a lot of the things that I've just talked about being problems for teams, autonomy, are also problems for teams uh, to perform in an agile way. So solving these problems, even if you don't have uh, autonomous teams today, is is going to help your just general uh, level of Uh, agile execution. So how do you do that? How do we avoid these sins? How do we be uh, autonomous saints instead of autonomous sinners? Well, first of all, we need to have clear values for the organization. The organizational values must be well understood, must be well communicated. That is an absolute critical element. Now, it seems sort of, I don't know, a, a little bit beyond and a little bit meta for what I've been talking about. But if you think about it, the values, and if they're true values, not not uh, something that's put on a wall that nobody believes, but they're true values of the organization, those give a context. Those give a, a set of, of uh, ideas that help you make decisions when you don't know which way to go. If there's two choices and one is well aligned to the organizational values and the other one isn't, the the answer should be obvious. So what we're doing by starting with the values is again, making it easier to make good decisions. Now from the values comes the vision, the vision for the team that should be well aligned to those values. Now, again, this is setting the North Star. This is helping alignment. And that vision should be not just it is the property and the creation of the team, but it is agreed upon by the stakeholders for the team, the leadership, other teams in the organization, to make sure that that vision makes sense with where the larger group is going. From the vision comes the mission. I've talked about the mission and I've talked about the vision already. They are very much related. The vision is what's the world going to be like when we solve our mission? The mission is what are the concrete steps we're taking to get there? Now, again, this also has is property of the team created by the team, but vetted and accepted by the stakeholders of the team, the peers of the team and the leadership for the organization because that is what gives permission for the team to make decisions. If a team is autonomous and is making decisions aligned with its mission, that mission is aligned to the vision, the vision is aligned to the values. If those things are in place, when a team makes a decision, that that should automatically be okay. There should be very little reason to contest or debate that decision unless it's, unless of course it's, it's a bad decision, but, but at least if it's well aligned to the mission and makes sense with the mission, that should be permission enough for the team to go forward without having to ask. The team goals are then aligned to the mission and these goals are objective goals. The goals owned by the team, created by the team, uh, but accepted, agreed upon by the stakeholders because the stakeholders have to agree that if these goals are being met, the team is going in the right direction. If this doesn't exist, if the goals aren't there or the goals aren't objective, you end up in a place where others have to step in and, and, t- and be more directly involved with the team, which takes away the team's autonomy. If the team is achieving its goals, the goals are aligned to mission, the mission's aligned to the vision, the vision's aligned to the values, 
there should be very little for the stakeholders of the team to need to interfere or step into the team. The team should just be allowed to go and go as quickly as it can. Now from this now, we also have the requirements and the things that the t that has to happen. The team needs the has to have the needed skills and resources to, to achieve their goals. If they don't have those in place by the organization, they can't achieve their goals, they can't achieve their mission, they can't achieve their vision. So all the, this has to also be given to the team. But if that is given and all those things are true, the team has to be held accountable. That means oversight, guidance, those things have to be in place. And if the team is not achieving its mission, if the team is not meeting its goals, someone has to make sure that the team is feeling accountability and that, account that, that the team is doing things to improve this. If the team is not being accountable for the goals that they agreed upon, the, the, the mission that they created, then there's a problem with the team and it needs to be rectified. So again, other teams uh, don't have to have, sorry, other teams have to have missions that don't overlap because if missions overlap, that creates friction. Multiple teams are working on the same problem and they're probably gonna be working on it in different ways because they don't need to coordinate. They're autonomous. And that's gonna create problems for the larger organization and the customer. So that those missions have to be distinct. The other part, all, along with this, they, while they can't overlap, everything needs to be under a team. A team needs to own everything. And that also it comes back to the organizational leadership to make sure that every, that every piece that needs to be owned is owned by some team. Because otherwise, and this is also a sin I've seen, uh, organizations have things that are just not owned by anybody because it doesn't feed, fit neatly into a team. And those are the pieces that fail and take down the entire organization. So everything needs to be owned and uh, part of a mission, but the mission shouldn't overlap. Now the team needs the, uh, you know, I've, I've said this multiple times. If you see me talk, I talk about this all the time. Make transparency, visibility into information, making sure the team gets all the information it needs to make good decisions. And it can't be decided from outside the team what information is relevant because if the team is autonomous, it's essentially a, a, a silo, it's a unit, and it isn't gonna be visible from outside the team what, what information is critical and which is not. All these things in place, the team taking accountability, the team taking responsibility means, and the, and the team has earned trust means that now leadership can protect the team from being randomized from these, this work coming in from outside the organization or outside the team. Now leadership then, if these things are in place, the team is making progress towards its goals. Those goals are aligned to the mission, which is aligned to the vision, which is aligned to the values. Then leadership can actually be in a place where it's just protecting the team because the team is just doing good work. And, uh, and, and interference with it is only going to make the team less efficient. But of course, that still requires that the team provides or the leadership of the organization provides uh, what I call gentle oversight. What I mean by that isn't every decision needs to be reviewed or approved. Uh, it means that the team's making decisions, leadership is paying attention to how things are going. If it is clear that things are going maybe in a bad direction, and that may not be obvious to the team, but it's obvious to leadership, and that's, that's why you have kind of senior leadership to be watching for this, then they need to work with the team to kind of get them back on track. And to do that in a gentle way that preserves their autonomy as much as possible. A way I think about this is asking hard questions of the team. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? What are you going to do about this? This seems to me like this could be a problem. If the team has those answers, it may be that, oh, leadership made a mistake and the team is going in a good direction but hopefully it should cause the team to question their decisions on their own and to correct them. So this essentially is, a, is building a, a, a framework, building a structure that builds upon itself. As I talked about the values, the organizational values, the team vision, the team mission, the team goals, these things create a, a, a foundation 
uh, that gives a lot of the things that the team needs in order to make good decisions. And then it needs to be able to execute upon them, which is leadership support, good information, having a unique mission so that they're not conflicting with other teams, resources they need to achieve their mission. Those things are in place. Now the team can be accountable to their goals, uh, to their mission, which means that they can now get leadership protection to let them execute without interference. And if you have all these things in place, then you have this lovely, uh, I'm going to call it the uh, layer cake of autonomy. I'm going to, I'm going to create a, a, a certification around that later, the, the layer cake of autonomy certification. So all those things, how do you create that? The, the one of the other sins I've seen is you might have, what's a product development has a very strong uh, autonomous team model, but the rest of the organization is just doing what it's always done. Like it would do at any company, which means you have this sort of pocket or sphere or silo of this one team model where the rest of the organization works just like it always has at every other company. And what you have is on the edges of this, where this, this autonomous team model meets the rest of the organization, you have a tremendous amount of friction and you have a tremendous amount of, of problems because of that. So you need to actually also have in place the company parts of the culture in order to make this work because otherwise the rest of the organization is going to look at this autonomous, autonomous team model, not understand it, challenge it, question it, uh, have a problem giving it trust because it doesn't make sense to them. It's not their own experience and it's not what they do. This I have seen, this I have lived. It is not fun. So how do you put these parts in place? Uh, we love talking about this idea. This is uh, outcome, not output. We love talking about this. Uh, the, it's true though. And the thing you also have to understand, we can talk about this in software development or in the world of agile or in the world of kind of modern leadership as much as we want. The rest of the world doesn't necessarily work that way. And if you can create that larger organizational company culture around this outcome, not output idea, that's going to be critical because the output of autonomous teams is not obvious. It's not clear. It is not necessarily going to be thousand lines of code. It's going to be these objective, uh, objective goals, objective metrics that if they are well aligned, as I've talked about multiple times, should be propelling the company forward, should be increasing profitability, should be increasing customer growth, whatever those goals are, are eventually tied to. But how they go about achieving those goals is uninteresting. It should be uninteresting to the rest of the company. If the rest of the company is looking for very specific pieces of output from the teams and they don't have any visibility into them, that will create friction. So you need to make sure that this, this idea makes sense and is accepted. Good communication flows. I'm gonna talk about communication again within the organization just making sure the information is available to the teams and not just from within the, the larger product development organization, from finance, from the customer, from the support team, from legal, uh, making sure that information is available to the team because again, once again, otherwise, the team's not gonna get the information it needs to make good decisions, it's going to make bad decisions, it's going to lose trust, the organization will challenge this model because they'll see a team acting not in accordance uh, with the organizational needs. And then it will come that they're going to expect legal reviews on decisions, um, uh, uh, sales uh, reviews, and, and the team will lose its autonomy and work will come in from the side. And understanding the whole organization needs to understand the structure, needs to understand the reasoning behind it, needs to understand the expectations upon it needs to be okay with it. Again, even if that's not how they want to organize, they need to be able to understand it so that they can find their entry points into it. Who do I need to ask? Who do I talk to if I need to ask a question? I remember at Spotify, one of the most frustrating things as kind of a new executive at the company was originally, 
oh, I'm curious how this works. Who do I talk to? Oh, you go talk to this squad. Okay, who, do, who in the squad do I talk to? No, you just go talk to the squad, the whole squad, because there, it's not clear who, the, who you in the team you should talk to. You just walk in, ask the question to everyone. Now, if you're not used to that kind of idea, th th that's going to sound ludicrous to you. And, and certainly, after I was there a little while, I would give that same answer. Someone from the sales team, I need to talk about this. Who do I talk to? Oh, go talk to this squad. Who do I talk to in the squad? You just go talk to the squad, right? That's a, that um, from the sales team, I, I was now living in that world. They were not living in that world. It made no sense to them. And that was a problem and that created friction. So having the organization understand this, and that may mean giving them the scaffold they need to kind of make sense into their worldview. Having honest feedback. Now, we, we again, we love feedback. In, in Agile, that's how we improve, right? If we're gonna be in continuous improvement, there is no continuous improvement without, without feedback. One of the challenges in autonomous team models is these teams become kind of silos. They, be, they are their own thing. They have very little interaction with each other because that's by design. They really don't need it. And if they did, that's probably a, a sign that you're doing something wrong. That doesn't mean teams don't see what's going on in other teams. That doesn't mean that peers within a team don't uh, see things. They need to be honest, they need to be open, they need to share this again, because this gives the team the information it needs to make good decisions and to improve and to address the needs of the larger organization. Mature teams, and when I talk about this, I don't mean um, age or, or time in career. I mean, Teams that have the, uh, you need teams that have professional maturity to be able to be autonomous. If your teams can't take on responsibility, can't take on accountability within the team or within the team structure that you're building, autonomy is going to fail because again, the team will either not be able to make progress because they won't be able to agree or uh, they won't feel accountable so they won't hit their goals they will lose trust. The team needs to have a level of maturity. I've seen this happen where uh, organizations flip into an autonomous team model from, from not having one and the teams just aren't ready for it. They're not mature enough for it. And again, they struggle in the, in the entire effort fails. Training and support. This is for providing the skills that a team needs. It's also for just supporting the teams. And this becomes a, a little bit more pull from the teams in this autonomous team model because you're not driving things again from above or from outside. The teams need to be able to pull in the training and support they need and that needs to be made available to them. So those pieces of culture act as sort of the autonomous layer cake uh, stand that supports it and makes it possible and makes it happen. So if these things are in place, the organizational culture is in place, the, the different pieces of, of uh, autonomy to support and, per, uh, and enable it are in place. If these things are happening, then you get this really good uh, autonomy team, autonomous team model. And it can work exceptionally well when it does work, when these pieces are in place. So I think the important part and what I want you to take from this is that the, it's not easy. It's not simple. I think when team, when, when people, when leaders, when agile coaches, when consultants think it is simple, that's when these sins happen because the organization's not ready for it. The pieces that are required aren't in place for it. And you set up this, uh, you set up a, a, a faux autonomous team structure that can't uh, support itself, that can't drive value to customers or to the company and then gets looks at is looked at as as a total failure and not only by the folks outside the teams but by the teams themselves because they feel that they really don't have autonomy when they when that is what they were promised so uh, once again so sorry i can't be there in person but i'm very happy to take questions now uh, and if you think of something later or you're watching this later uh, this top uh, is me, and the bottom uh, contact is is my company. Please uh, feel free to to reach out, and I'm very happy to take your questions.
Thanks again. Thanks for the for the presentation, um, Kevin. I can see that uh, there was some question on uh, chat, and I would like uh, come back to those question and. Uh, please uh, and ask you to answer because uh, not all of us uh, follow the chat. I remember um, this question, how to help the team uh, keep the, them accountable, do not interfere directly and uh, draw the consequences uh, we needed. So yeah, sorry, I was, I was uh, eagerly answering the questions in chat. So now you can see if I actually give the same answer I gave moments ago. Uh, at the, uh, and we'll a good test. So how to keep the team accountable. Uh, so again, it's about setting expectations with the team. It's about making clear to the team what the consequences of those expectations are. So one of the reasons why I advocate very strongly that the team creates their vision, creates their goals, but then gets approval uh, or acceptance of those goals and mission and those things from the stakeholders so if this is a mutually agreed upon thing, it's created by the team, the team owns it, but it's agreed upon generally. The team also understands that if they do not uh, achieve these goals, right? So there's missing them by a little and missing them by a lot. Sometimes the, the, team, the, the goal should be reasonable because the organization, the team created them and the organization approved them, right? So there's some oversight, there's some sense checking here that the, the goals make sense. But then the other part of that is, okay, now the team is accountable. Just like at the end of a sprint, a scrum sprint, right? You're supposed to be achieving whatever. That's the same idea. The difference is if a team is repeatedly missing the goals, the consequences are very strong because what will happen is the team loses trust with the organization. And when you lose trust, everything I was talking about was essentially about maintaining trust with the larger organization. That's what enables autonomous teams to work. If the organization, if the leadership doesn't trust the team, they cannot, they, they will feel obligated to interfere with the decisions of the team, which means the team has lost its autonomy. So that is the initial consequence. Team doesn't achieve its goals or leadership starts stepping in, starts saying, let's review your decisions or we'd like to approve them because we don't see that you're achieving the goals you're setting. Now, if that continues, and obviously no one wants that, that's, that's not gonna be a good situation for the team, definitely it's gonna feel bad, but it's also kind of a waste of time for the leadership, right? It makes it hard to scale if leadership has to be involved in the daily decisions of every team. So if that continues, even with this kind of team losing its autonomy, the next thing is maybe this is the wrong set of people in the team, or maybe this is the wrong team. And then you go into a situation where maybe you're changing around the people in the team, trying to get a, a team that's gonna be working better. And I think the ultimate goal, like there's, there's financial, right? So people's reviews, their raises are tied to at some level achieving the goals of the team. And team oriented goals like team bonuses are really good here. And the, uh, the most obvious, the biggest consequence would be people lose their job. Right. If the team is is struggling to be, is is unaccountable, the team you you have a autonomous team organization. This team is failing. You're going to have to figure out what, like any f failing team, you have to figure out what the cause of that failure is, and the consequence. It might be people lose their job. So and people need to understand that these things. And you start obviously there. It's a progression here, but as that is demonstrated, it becomes clear to the whole organization. Right there are consequences for uh, for not doing, not achieving our goals, right? And that is a very strict accountability. But usually when the team starts to lose its autonomy, especially if the teams around it are autonomous, that sends a pretty strong signal to the organization what the consequences of lack of accountability are. Okay, thanks. Uh... You mentioned about a uh, tremendous role of uh, the leadership. Uh, how to present the advantage of uh, autonomous team to high level management, uh, how to talk with board members about it. Uh, I would like to, uh, based your, on your experience as a VP and a CTO. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. So the probably most, uh, 
the probably best example I have of this was um, uh, Avo, which I was CTO of Avo after I left Spotify. And I talked about Avo, I think in the 2016 um, Agile by example and some of the things that we were do doing there. Now that was a case where uh, when I joined the company, they'd had some of these ideas, but they hadn't, I mean, they just didn't have the, the, the maturity in leadership to kind of understand how to do this well. And, and I really wanted, the, the company was growing. I'd just come from Spotify with a very mature kind of autonomous team model. And by the way, some of the, the sins I talked about were from Spotify, right? And th that this, I should also give credit, right? Because a Spotify scene all the time is this, uh, especially Spotify when I was there, like 2013 to 2016, as this really great autonomous team model. Um, that phrase, you're doing autonomy wrong, actually is something one of the, the uh, uh, chapter leads said to me, not to me personally, you're doing autonomy wrong, but, but uh, um, uh, talking about a, a kind of problem we had at Spotify with maybe over autonomous teams, right? So that's where I got that phrase from. Anyway, at Avo, um, I wanted to build this, uh, I, I wanted to take what they were doing with their teams to help the company scale, really see if I could do an autonomous team model in a different way than we've done it at Spotify. And part of the, the way I convinced the rest of the senior leadership team to do this was around setting these, like there was a perception in the company that development wasn't accountable. And I've heard this in, in I don't know, a dozen companies, right? People come, either companies I'm joining or people, companies uh, I'm interviewing with and people are telling me, oh, well, the development team's not accountable, which means they're not hitting their goals. But a lot of times their goals are being set from outside the team, right? So the, the team doesn't feel ownership of those goals. And I was trying to convince the senior leadership team, like, look, like we need to structure our teams in a little bit of a different way. There was already a feeling that development wasn't achieve, wasn't working well because there were they were having these kind of unreasonable goals set from outside the team uh, by senior leadership that the teams didn't feel accountable to because they weren't their goals, and then they weren't achieving them. So you know, product milestones were being missed, all those kinds of things. So I put it to them this way: uh, you know, what if uh, I? I from, to start with, like, let's not talk about the fact that these teams are autonomous. Let's just talk about their deliverables. And then let's talk about how we best achieve them. So what we're going to do, we're going to change the way we set goals a little bit differently. We're going to let the team set their goals. We're going to make sure that we all agree upon the goals that they set. And we started from that. So we started from very much a, to the rest of the company, it was about setting good goals and then the teams committing to achieve them. Within that kind of silo of product development, the, the chief product officer and I in, kind of worked towards, okay, look, we're going to, you've, you've always been complaining because when I talked to the development teams, they were complaining that goals were being set on them as opposed to them kind of, and, and were unreasonable. You're going to own the goals now, but you're also going to be responsible for achieving them and they need to make sense with everything else. So that's where we started was from this goal model. And then from that goal model, the chief product officer and I, who obviously, if we weren't both in agreement about doing this, it wasn't going to happen anyway, right? So that's, you have to have at least agreement within the product development org. You can't just have a team decide to be autonomous. That won't work. That's the larger cultural element I talked about. But the chief product officer and I were very much in line with this. Uh, I convinced him because he also saw these issues. He didn't have necessarily this way of solving them, but he was willing to let me try this. Um, and so this is where we started. So for the rest of the organization, it just looked like we we're setting good goals and then we were committing to achieve them. As we did that, then we started to talk about this is how we did it. And because we needed to educate the larger organization so they kind of understood that we were doing things in this way so that they could at least support it. But the way we got um, buy-in and the board never cared, right? The board doesn't care what your team model is. Um, if your board is getting that involved in the decisions, I've worked with lots of boards. If your board is getting that involved in the decisions of the company, you have a board problem and you have a senior leadership of the company problem because the board is entrusting the, the company leadership. Um, so I'm gonna put the board aside for the moment. Um, but uh, then the rest of the company just sees that product development is, is finally 
achieving its goals or when it's not, it's taking responsibility for them. And then you start to build this trust and then you can talk about the, how you did it and, and, and start to gain sort of uh, an understanding. But it, again, you're, you're, you're achieving trust first. And that's the, that's the critical piece. Okay, thanks. Um, one, one more question. And uh, how to work with, uh, let's call them first uh, line management. Uh, uh, previously, they have fully responsible for, for the team and suddenly their teams are autonomous. Uh, hmm. they, they might be reluctant. reluctant. Uh, they might uh, lose uh, control. How to, how to work with them? So, uh, uh, as I said in the talk, um, there is no, there's no requirement in, in, what, in building an autonomous team model for there not to be line management responsibility for the team. So I'm not talking about self-governing teams necessarily. Now we did do that at Spotify, but I've done, that's not what we did at Ava. We had team leaders um, and those team leaders were autonomous. Um, the teams were autonomous, but that doesn't mean that you can't have a management structure that has a one or two or three people, right? You know, product management, engineering management, design, you know, what we sometimes call the trio or the three amigos or even, you know, um, tests or however you want to structure your teams. That's completely different. That's completely independent of whether those teams are autonomous or not. Now, I've seen lots of non, I've been at Microsoft, right? Like you'd have team management, those teams weren't autonomous because every decision a product lead made had to get approved, right? At, at, at worst case in scenarios, when I was at Adobe, like big, like I had a lot of autonomy except for big decisions I would have to get on a calendar for a senior VP to approve on, right? I didn't, I had a lot of autonomy, but I wasn't fully autonomous. Um, so you can have a team manager, right? So if you're moving to an autonomous team model and the team management, and it doesn't either incorporate the current team management or make sense of what the current team management is supposed to do, the line management, then you, you've got to, you've got to figure that out. You can't just, if you're, if your line managers are, are rebelling against your autonomous, your designed autonomous team model, your does, it's not a good design. Right, because it should, they should understand what their roles are. And if you're saying that the folks who are doing that job are really not bought into this, they were, okay, uh, either not part of the, the creation of this, so they feel no ownership, they just feel lost. Their jobs are being defined, they're, they're losing a lot of responsibility, which is fine, but that may mean like, if they're not okay with that and you're really dedicated to this new model, these people may, you may not, you may need different line managers. So, I mean, I'm speaking at this very much coming from like a CTO perspective, right? So I'm not coming at this from like an agile coach perspective, but for me, if we're moving to like a new organizational model and part of the organization, if, if, if there's very strong belief and this is the direction we should go and part of the organization doesn't is very much dead set against it. They don't they don't like the change or they don't want to go in that new direction. That says that at some level, either I didn't bring them into the decision making process, I didn't include them in the process. So they don't again, they don't feel any ownership over it. They just want to push back against it. Or it means, no, I did that. They still don't like it, but this is the way we're going. That's fine, but that may mean that I'm going to need to hire some new line managers. Um, so I, 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 there is a place with any kind of change, right? This is, this is culture change. This is organizational change. There is a place here where some part of the organization is going to decide that where you're going is not for them. If you're serious about making this change, there's going to be a part of your organization that just doesn't want to make the change. And that's okay. That's, that's, that's life, right? You don't not do the change. If you feel strongly about it, you don't not do the change. If you've gone about doing the change in a good way, in a healthy way, there's lots of bad, ch like change management projects. I, I'm not saying those are okay, 
But if you're doing this in an inclusive way, in, in an involved way, in an agile way, or in a people first way, you're really trying to bring everybody along with you and some of them just don't wanna come, that's fine. You don't want them there because they will just be continuously pushing against you. Okay, Kevin, thanks. Uh, thanks for your, uh, for your answers.